newspaper men meet such interesting people. They know the lowdown, now it can be told. I'll tell you quite reliably off the record about some charming people I have known. For I meet politicians and grafters by the score. Killers, plain and fancy, it's really quite a bore. Oh, newspaper men meet such interesting people. They wallow in corruption, crime and gore. Ting-a-ling-ling, -ling, city desk. Pull the press, pull the press. Extra, extra, read all about it. It's Welcome to the Media Project, an inside look at media coverage of current events. And I'm not Rex Smith, I'm Mike Spain, filling in as the host this week while Rex is out. And joining us today are investigative journalist and UAlbany professor Rosemary Armeo and Judy Patrick, the Vice President of Editorial Development for the New York Press Association. A couple of veteran journalists here talking about the media. And we're happy to be here with you, Mike. You're delighted. <laughs> you hosted last week, and it was a great show. Let's hope we can do it again. <laughs> well, a lot of talk, of course, this week about hurricanes. You know, we had the tragedy in, in Maui, and now we're watching the aftermath of hurricanes going through the Atlantic and then tearing across Florida into Georgia and the Carolinas as it goes out to sea. So as natural disasters and extreme environmental conditions become more commonplace around the world this summer, scientists have pointed repeatedly to a shared driver, climate change. Conspiracy theorists are pointing to anything but. This is according to a story in the New York Times. It says, after these hurricanes hit us this year, some falsely claimed that they were because of all kinds of different reasons. They continue to call global warming a hoax. They say that the hurricane in Maui might have been caused by Oprah Winfrey deliberately trying to <laughs> spoil land and buy up more land. I mean, ridiculous things. And now, of course, Oprah Winfrey is being praised for raising money to restore the areas that were hit by the, the terrible fires. Anyway, so we go on, and every time there's any kind of a, a global warming-fueled crisis, the Internet is ablaze, no pun intended, with efforts to uh, blame it on something else, saying the government is seeding clouds, that's why we got the rain, they wanted to break a nearby dam and cause that, they think that this is going on all over the world, Greece, Italy, Rwanda have all experienced extreme weather this year, and they don't want it to be attributed to man's contribution to the whole idea of global warming. What can you do when so many people are saying contradictory things? How does a journalist get through that and present the facts? And how can they make a convincing case for what the overwhelming percentage of scientists have already concluded? You know, the thing is that people are believing that Oprah Winfrey could have possibly started the blaze in Maui, the, that people believe all of these things. Because you can tell because if you're on social media, you see them retweeting it or posting it themselves. I'm always fascinated about where these ideas originate. Is there some cabal someplace coming up with these ideas? You know, there's a hurricane headed for Florida. Let's get some ideas out there that we can put out there and make it sound as though it's not um, climate change. I think the traditional media is still trying as hard as it can, but wow, the, the memes, the social media posts are just so hard to counter. Although I will say that most of the people I'm on social media with do tend to cruise by those posts, but if you walk the streets of America, there's still a lot of people out there that believe everything they see online. Now, Rosemary, perhaps one of the reasons you went into journalism was so that you could give truth to people and they could use the information you're giving them to come to their own conclusions. Is that something that even works anymore? Yeah, I, 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 we always learned, and I still continue to teach that one of the main functions of media is to dispel false rumors. This is a, a good example. I, I don't think it's a conspiracy to think there are cabals who sit down and put together disinformation campaigns. We saw that in the election, the first Trump election in 2016, where there were whole farms of Russian trolls and Eastern European teenagers who were putting out disinformation widely believed and disseminated by Americans. And that continues. Social media continues to be a big problem. Well, interestingly, these sort of crazies out on the Internet have a little bit of support from 
the traditional oil companies and companies sure. that for years have been trying to dispel the notion that human behavior is contributing to global warming. And they kind of go hand in hand now. They're not necessarily connected, but they're ready for that skepticism that's brought by these wild theories that, that they're using to counter the notion that science has concluded that human behavior has caused global or it contributed to global warming. There's another area of misinformation out there that, that's uh, pretty fascinating this week. KFF, which is an independent source for health policy research. They do a lot of surveys. They've done a survey about the way that people understand health information, anything ranging from COVID-19, vaccinations, all the way through to sex education. And even because it is a major <laughs> cause of injury and death in the U.S., they've done surveys on perceptions by uh, the public on guns and gun control and such. And one of the things that they found, when you look at the bar charts of their survey results, it's like 25 percent, 30 percent of Americans believe that COVID-19 vaccines have caused thousands of sudden deaths in otherwise healthy people. That is false. It's been proven false. 34 percent of Americans see that as probably being false. And only 31 percent say that's definitely false, even though if you looked at the data, it would definitely prove that it's a false statement. And this goes on. I mean, you remember ivermectin? It was the miracle drug that mm -hmm. President Trump promoted as a the treatment. Right. It's a deworming medication. And then President Trump boasted that it was effective for treating COVID-19. That was before vaccines came out. Still, 26 to 30 percent of Americans believe that today. And it's astounding. And, and you go on and people say that measles and mumps and rubella vaccines, you know, people believe, a lot of people believe that it's been proven to cause autism, even though that has vastly been disproven. And when it comes to sex education, people believe that if you teach sex education, it increases sexual activity among teens and causes unwanted pregnancies. And yet 25, 29 percent also believe that using birth control as it's uh, used today makes it difficult for women after they end the birth control to get pregnant again, which is proven. Again, the facts have debunked that. So how do we do it? How do we do it as journalists? Just say it over and over and over again. We look for different ways to say it. Is it talking about the disinformation? The old liberal belief was that if you just gave people enough information, they would get it. They would all come to see things the way you, as the purveyor of the information, saw it. And we have learned, especially in the digital age, that the exact opposite happens. The more you bombard them with evidence with the data with that hard proof that you're citing they say no no i don't care what that says i i think the way i want to think people Truth dig in and they people and dig in and be and believe what they want to believe so the idea that vaccines cause problems that you know autism is because you're the father's too old probably that's what most research shows it's a lot nicer to believe i'm fine it's the vaccine to blame I mean, you look at each one of those disbeliefs. The vaccine causes problems. I'm not going to get vaccine. Well, you don't have to go to the trouble of getting it. You don't have to worry about the pain of it. It's comforting to believe myths. And I think the media, yes, has to keep repeating the truth and going after it. But we should not hope to ever win over everybody. You know, we're seeing this again with the, this newest surge in COVID cases. The whole thing about vaccines, about different ways of treating it abounds on the Internet. You know, there's always been a fringe part of our society that, you know, questions vaccines, but that was fringe until the pandemic, I think. And with ivermectin, the dewormer, part of the problem was that you had the president of the United States saying it was a good idea. And social media has just flooded us with uh, bad health advice. The same survey also looked at who people turned to for information, and they said just 25% of people had a high trust in the news media. But the one entity they do trust is their doctor. Now, that may be reassuring to a lot of people, but how many people actually go to their doctor? Yeah, well, uh, at or ask doctor, the doctor's Doctor's opinion. advice is why Oxycontin became a huge problem here, and the uh, Purdue Pharma knew to go to the doctors to so, sell them on it. So if you're skeptical patient. about yeah. what your doctor tells you, there might be grounds for it when you present them with the fact that Oxycontin was and promulgated gets, by doctors. The media gets some blame, yeah. too. When sure. ivermectin came out, many doctors you know, said, well, I don't know, but this is worth studying. This, this drug, yes, it's a dewormer, but it does have antifungal properties. 
activities. There is some little evidence that shows you use this in connection with some other drugs in a cocktail, and it actually works. It was worth studying. We portrayed it in the media. We still portray it in the media as ridiculous. Only ignorant people would use a dewormer. No, we were dismissive, too. doesn't help our case. doesn't oh. build the trust that's missing. Perhaps the problem is if you don't like what you're hearing or what you're reading, you can find an alternative True. perspective just by Googling. Even if it has no basis in fact, it might be comforting to you. <laughs> you know, when one of the COVID surges, you heard people from the hospital saying, I should have gotten the vaccine. I mean, the thing is, you're responsible for your own health at, at the end. And if you get a bad case of COVID because you didn't get the vaccine, you're ultimately responsible for yourself. You know, the, one of the other points of this survey was people didn't have a lot of trust in the traditional news media. They also said that they didn't have a lot of trust in social media. I find that a little bit reassuring, <laughs> but maybe it's on the par with traditional media. Two things. I want to point out that another mistake the media made was to run story after story about those people dying, begging for a vaccine, and having to be told, no, it's too late now. We overdid it. At least there's a belief there that was we a, did. There, were a lot there was a lot of repeat on that. So that's one thing. Another mistake we made, we talk down to people when we think it's bleach. Really, you're going to drink bleach to get rid of it, which our president at the time recommended. People are dying of it, are still dying of it, still believe it's there. And we need to take that seriously, I think. Well, I want to swing back to our discussion about the weather and about the storms that have just recently rolled through Florida and caused billions in damage. When you turn on the TV, often you'll see a, an area has been under mandatory evacuation, and yet you see a journalist standing there with his coat blowing in the wind. You can hardly hear him holding on to a microphone. Why should a journalist be allowed to go into you, an area the, that— You can hear the wind in the, in the microphone. Yeah, right. It's I dramatic. I like when stuff is blowing around in the back and well, they have you to know, duck. And... Well, it's risky, and it requires public resources, public safety officials, to be there in case something goes wrong and rescue that person. And it gets to a broader case, which, Rosemary, you know a lot about. You've trained journalists all over the world. Why should journalists even be allowed in dangerous places? Okay, so there is a value. Where the public is not allowed. Where the public is yeah. barred and where they're on camera telling people, don't do what I'm doing in essence. Don't try this at home. But there is value in it. Number one is if you've left your house, if you've evacuated, you want to see what it's really like. Did I make the right decision? You have to see somebody there to do that. And the second thing is studies, I think, show that when they do, when this information, this evidence is presented, officials tend to do something. Action gets taken. FEMA comes Isn't in faster. Yeah. Officials, the governor will say, okay, I declare an emergency. FEMA moves in. It does have an effect. On the other hand, it's completely cliche. I wish we could come up with a different way to show it, right? Well, they We're do. talking they, about they, it because it's yeah. there. It happens so often. Isn't there any other way to show storm damage to accomplish the good of sending the reporter out there without that? Just kind of boring. It's a boring image right now. But the reporter's using their credibility and their presence to give life to that story. What I found amazing was that at least one study showed that Jim Cantor, who is like the superstar weather of weather on the Weather Channel, yeah. if he goes to a place, FEMA will react, they federal did. funds right. will come sooner to that place than the next place that might be just as devastated or even have worse impact of a storm. And maybe there's something wrong with that, but at least the media is using this to call attention to where the government has to pay attention. You know, we've done that as well. Probably you did it when you had to send a photographer, especially photographers. When you're talking about local news, you need to get an image out there. The re the person writing the story can stand it, stay in the office, but sometimes you're sending them into danger. Into danger, sure. and, but they need but they have to be in danger to get the image that or the images that tell we the need. story. So expand yeah. this to say like war coverage. Does, exactly. does a reporter really have to go out on the scene, on the front line, in the foxhole? And it's a great frustration to many war correspondents that they do that in order to, and all the things we're talking about, bring it home, bring the story, make it real. Give it bring authenticity. You along. Right, authenticity, yeah. all that. And it really doesn't have any much of an effect at all. I always consider the death of Marie Colvin who covered the horrible uh, destruction in Syria by its own government. It was just bombing cities and killing people, bombing hospitals. And she was there. And she couldn't leave. She said, as long as there's anybody, a civilian here, I need to be here to tell their story. 
but that's government. courageous. I mean, it is courageous. It, it the needs... government ended up bombing the building she was sheltering in specifically because she was there to get rid of her. So did it do any good, really? What if she had written the story and then gone, left? Mm. I don't know. I am always troubled by this. I admire their courage. I don't want to do it myself. I don't go into war zones. No, I don't go into hurricanes either. Do yeah, yeah. And, and <laughs> one thing that annoys me about the, about the hurricane coverage are when cable stations will interview people who have or, or are ignoring orders to evacuate. Right. Trying to make heroes oh. of them. And, yes. This week, even NPR was uh, interviewing people who were refusing to evacuate when it was recommended by the local yeah. authorities because. In the past, they were told that they were going to, and they did evacuate, and when they evacuated, it turns out their house was fine. But that just shows that you can't be particularly precise where where the hurricane is going to roll through and destroy one area and not another area. But it, it is it is about how much people trust either the authorities or the, the weather the service or the, right. or the journalism and the communication that they're getting. When or they their mother. The I've been yelling at my son, get out of there. He's right. in Northport, Florida. <laughs> You're listening to The Media Project, a production of Northeast Public Radio. We have Rosemary Armeo, Judy Patrick, and I'm Mike Spain. And uh, we're coming from Albany, New York, where we're quite interested in stories that involve New York state government. There was a very interesting uh, story this week by the media critic for the Washington Post, Eric Wemple, who, by the way, hails from the capital region of New York state. And he was looking into the downfall of Governor Andrew Cuomo and his resignation, which was brought by repeated credible reports and perhaps not so credible reports, it turns out, of his womanizing and alleged sexual harassment. And it turns out that the New York Post, New York Magazine, Bloomberg, even the Wall Street Journal were quoting a former staff member, Anna Liss Jackson, frequently. And she allowed her name and her position, which she had held in the Cuomo administration, to be used in the stories. And she was constantly being attributed, well, she constantly told of wild parties that she heard about and people complaining about the governor leering at them and had said something like, my desk was put right out in front so the governor could look at me when, in fact, it was many offices away. But if all the doors were open, he could actually look at her, but it wasn't often that way. And it turns out, because of a deposition in one of the credible lawsuits brought by a a state trooper who said the governor had harassed her, sexually harassed her, a deposition, a 200-page deposition by Anna Liss Jackson shows that most of the information she was giving to the media was hearsay. She had not witnessed any of it. How come we do that in the media? We, we love to get a source on the record. It's a lot better than saying unnamed sources or saying someone close to the administration, et cetera, et cetera. And yet when we do, don't we have an obligation to make sure that they're not just telling us baloney? <laughs> this is so basic information. And it's it's a conversation I'm sure you had a hundred times with the reporters. The fact that she was on the record, it doesn't matter. The re- editor has to ask, well, was she in a position to know this? And how did she know this? This is a conversation, a routine conversation people have with reporters all the time. I mean, in this case, it was just scuttlebutt. She had heard around the office. There was some... It was the narrative that people would say around the office. And and you know that a lot of that times it's, hy- it's hyperbole. Not always. And and there are credible cases. I don't want to deny that, that there are credible allegations that uh, will be decided in a court of law involving Andrew Cuomo's behavior while he was governor. But in this particular case, the source was really not a reliable source. Yeah, Judy is right. It's the first thing in interviewing class is you say, what do you mean by that? Why? How do you know? Does anybody else know? Can I talk to somebody else who will tell me the same thing? And that does not appear to be done here. Was there uh, a stampede by reporters who didn't like Andrew Cuomo himself. He's not a likable guy. Didn't like him himself. They'd heard it fit in with the narrative they were given that he was going after women and kind of mean in the office. Did they just buy it? And and I'll tell you, I'll go further because it has always troubled me that the attorney general's report, based in part, prompted definitely by reporting, said, oh yeah, he's this is prosecutable. He, he was a sexual harasser. And no lawsuit has been brought because it doesn't hold up in court. And Yes, reporters don't have the same standard as a court of law, but they ought to be awfully close to it. 
and we I don't think we were in this case. Yeah, and I think that, the, the, that there's also the pressure, Those all those Capitol reporters or the reporters who covered state government, they were under pressure to produce stories about this right. too because it was it was gaining steam. And even when something is gaining steam and the editors <laughs> is want you to, to, to develop the story one more step, you gotta, you got to hold back and say, this isn't a good source. But that said, we have a growing culture that it's okay to lie to the media. You remember mm -hmm. Sarah Huckabee Sanders, who testified in connection with January 5th, like, oh, yeah, I just lied about that, but, you know. Well, and in it's fact, not a crime to lie to the press. And, and, she's, and she, this woman absolutely used her position to game the media. She knew what she was doing. Mm -hmm. And so, I, I, yes, I fault the reporters. They were not careful enough. But she's also very much to blame she was a liar in in essence deceitful right. well, she yeah. she was arguing that that's what she was trained to do as part of her official yeah. duties that it's yeah. okay exactly. to to, yeah. to to color what you tell the press and eric wemple points out in his uh, in his piece about all this that it was one of the extremely inflammatory stories that used uh, this woman as the source the next day, that's when uh, the Senate Majority Leader, leader in uh, New York State's legislature, Andrea Stewart-Cousins, came out yeah. publicly and demanded that uh, Governor Cuomo step down. So it does. You, I mean, you read this story and you begin to understand why Andrew Cuomo won't let this go, why he yeah. keeps pressing I, and, it. And this really actually, it must the, annoy him so much. Right. And this, it's pretty clear that the deposition that uh, was part of a civil suit uh, where this person— um, you know, made these comments that really compromised her credibility now after the fact, was probably handed to Eric Wemple by Cuomo's people. It's I wouldn't be yep. surprised, you know, yep. because they're trying their best to uh, reestablish his reputation. Anyway, let's move on to a topic everybody's talking about, chat, GBT. Different news organizations are experimenting with it. Uh, the Associated Press is embracing it in many ways. Gannett had a problem with it. Would you like to talk about it, Rose? <laughs> well, they, they've been using it to do high school games, and I think it's a fabulous idea. I did high school games working for UPI <laughs> for years and hated it. It's completely formulaic. This team beat this team, or you change the word beat, use different verbs, battled, conquered, blah, blah, blah. And it's absolutely made for GPT. However, everyone needs an editor, including, it turns out, chat GPT. So they were getting articles actually in the paper because no one looked at it, went right from computer into paper saying things like, insert loser mascot here. <laughs> 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 Very embarrassing and really fixable. Um, but instead, I guess Gannett has decided to suspend the use of chat GPT until they get things worked out better. And another interesting development involving AI and chat GPT was many of the leading news organizations, the New York Times, the Washington Post, Hearst Media, uh, Gannett, believe it or not, have blocked their stories from being ingested into chat GBT. Oh, yeah. In Trainers. other words, in order for you know, artificial intelligence to be successful and to be more accurate, they have to have lots and lots and lots of information. Well, they were starting to pull in, you know, vacuum in all the information on the internet, but what's the best information on the internet? That which is attributed, that which comes from reliable sources. So the New York Times, the Washington mm -hmm. Post, Gannett, and all the other big media companies are blocking ChatGBT from absorbing these, which means that it will be less reliable. Exactly. Now, good what point. is that a good thing or a bad thing? It is their work. It is their it is property. Hers. It's their intellectual property. And to have it become in the general, you know, part of the general domain is problematic to them because they are not getting compensated for what they produce. And on the literary side and the artistic side, we're seeing the same thing. Exactly. Uh, artists do not want their paintings and drawings images. included. Images, right. Even and, photographers, yeah. And great works of fiction. Can GPT, Chat GPT, someday write the great American novel? Well, if they read Barbara Kingsolver and Richard Russo and all those works go in there, yeah, they can someday. So is that a good thing or a bad thing? I can argue it actually either way. I would like to see us use Embrace Chat GPT as a tool the same way that we did, say, the calculator. Is it really necessary for humans to use their brain power on adding and subtraction and long division? Uh, we can do higher math. Is it not the same true for journalism or literature or art? 
Yeah, from a media perspective, I have to applaud it because they're they're standing up and trying to preserve their rights. Uh, but from a general knowledge perspective, this is and in terms of being able to use artificial intelligence credibly, it, it's bad. But a lot of the stuff's already been taken. I mean, maybe the horse has already left this barn. Yeah, <laughs> that that may be the reality. That as much as they, I think, have a legal right and an ethical. Uh, position to hold on to their intellectual property, this horse has already left the barn. Moving along, as we are closing out on this program, CNN looks like it's going to get another reboot. CNN has been really sagging in, in the past year. It's fallen behind in ratings to MSNBC. It's way behind Fox on the TV ratings. And it's, uh, it, you know, and now it's owned by Time Warner, and it is going to have a new boss, and it's Mark Thompson. He's the the British guy that uh, rescued the BBC and then came to head the New York Times back in 2012 and essentially turn a print publication with a digital presence into a digital operation with a print presence mm-hmm. yeah, very successfully and really boosted the New York Times. And now he's being drafted to bring CNN back. Is it too late? And every time I turn on CNN, I'm, I think to myself, "What are they? What are they going to hit me with now?" Because it it seems like it's been ever changing, and it, there's there's no there's not a lot of stability. They were going uh, during hurricane coverage. You, you saw uh, them really focus on hard news coverage, which they are known for, and they do very well. I'm anxious to to see what what he does with this. I mean, uh, what his ideas are to turn it around. One of the things that uh, Variety was reporting um, recently was that they were going to start having, because it's part of this um, Warner Discovery family of enterprises, that you may start seeing CNN crawlers on entertainment shows on HBO Max. And it's like, wow, that's the last thing in the world anybody wants. They are going to give them dedicated space on the giant new Max app, Max uh, format that, that's on cable now. And they're going to leave a lot of their primetime programs right on it, but they also have a vast library of documentaries and news footage going back to the 80s. So I wonder if they're going to block it from chat GP. Well, that's very interesting. <laughs> well, that's a great question to consider, but it's time. <laughs> I want to thank Rosemary Armeo and Judy Patrick and our producer, David Gustina. I'm Mike Spain. Thanks for joining us, and we'll see you next week on The Media Project. The Media Project is a national production of WAMC Northeast Public Radio. This week's projectors include former Times Union Associate Editor Mike Spain, Judy Patrick, former editor of the Daily Gazette and vice president for editorial development for the New York Press Association, and Rosemary Armeo, investigative journalist and adjunct professor at the University at Albany. You can listen to The Media Project anytime at wamcpodcasts.org or anywhere you get your podcasts. I'm David Gustina. Thanks for listening. Thanks for listening.